Turn to the person next to you, smile and say, you are the best looking thing I've seen all day. Tell them you are hot. I do that because <laughs> hopefully you're sitting next to your wife or your husband. And if you're not, hopefully you're sitting next to someone you wish was your wife or your husband. And if you're not and you're single, I'm going to do it again second service. So stay over, scope it out. Just trying to help you out. <laughs> hey, Jake and Bessie found each other in their old age. Jake was 92 and Bessie was 89. They were so in love, they decided to get married. Well, one day they went to the pharmacist and uh, they talked to the pharmacist and they said to the pharmacist, hey, um, pardon me, but I wonder if you sell heart medication here. <laughs> Jake and the pharmacist said, well, yes, we do. He says, well, how about medication for arthritis and Parkinson's and jaundice? Yes, we sell that too. Well, what about Geritol and denture cream and reading glasses? Yeah, we have that as well. Well, do you have wheelchairs and canes and walkers? Do you sell that too? He said, yes, sir, we have it all. He said, great, Jake said, because I'm going to marry this lovely lady, and I want to register here for all of our wedding gifts. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> and then what's sad is the older I get, the more real that is. <laughs> hey, get your Bible and uh, turn with me to the book of Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. We are right smack dab in the midst of an amazing sermon series on, uh, that pastor has been, been bringing to the church. And uh, if you haven't heard those messages on the, uh, on the creed of God, there's a Nicene creed, then you need to go back and listen. And I want to tie in to those things. We're about to read a prophecy given by Isaiah describing the coming of Jesus into the world. As a way of introduction, the prophet Isaiah lived in the 8th century B.C. So this prophecy is about 700 years prior to Jesus of Nazareth being born in Bethlehem of Judea. And if that's not mind-blowing enough, in Luke 4 and 20, it is recorded that Jesus read from the scroll of Isaiah, and then he sits down in the synagogue. And then after reading, Jesus sits down, and all of the eyes in the synagogue were laying upon him because he begins to say, today these words are fulfilled in your hearing. And there is no doubt in the mind of everyone there that he was pointing to himself as the fulfillment of, of the prophecy, and he affirms that he is the one Isaiah is speaking about. He's basically announcing to everyone, I am the Messiah. I am the one that God will perform his redemptive acts through for all of eternity. Ultimately, Jesus' life, death, and burial, resurrection on the cross perfectly illustrates the fulfillment of the prophecy we're about to read in Isaiah 53. Remember, it is 700 years prior to Jesus' coming. Tell me that God doesn't have everything taken care of. Follow along as I read Isaiah 53, 1 through 6 from the King James. And Isaiah describes the sin-bearing Messiah. Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He has no form of comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he abhorred our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But, we are, but he was wounded for our transgression. The transgression is the open rebellion against God. It's when you do something, and you know you do it, and it's wrong, but you do it anyway because you like it. You transgress the law of God. The Bible says he was bruised for that, but he was bruised for our iniquities. The iniquity is the secret sin, the things you do in private to cover up what you've already done in public. Some translations say he was crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of of us all. What an amazing prophecy, 700 years before Jesus was even born in Bethlehem of Judea. 
In this prophecy, Isaiah asks two very important questions. First, who believes the report? And second, to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? The significance of these questions becomes apparent when you realize whoever believes this report, that is who the arm of the Lord will be extended to. These two questions then let us know why so many people do not choose Jesus as their Lord and Savior. It's simply because they don't believe the report. They don't believe he is the Messiah. So they are filled with doubt and unbelief. Therefore, the arm of the Lord does not extend to them because of their doubt and unbelief. Now listen to the metaphor Isaiah uses in verse 2 to describe the culture or to describe the atmosphere that God was about to plant his only begotten son into. Verse 2, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. Isaiah is trying to draw a mental picture for the people of Israel because God is showing him prophetically the Messiah is coming. And he's trying to warn them that his coming will be different than anything they have ever thought of or seen before or experienced in their past. He's letting them know that the atmosphere, the political culture, the environment that God will plant Jesus into will not be conducive to success or to growth. Isaiah is saying he's going to be planted into adverse extreme conditions. But those adverse conditions will not determine the outcome of his life. Those adverse conditions will not determine the outcome of his life. You might be experiencing adverse circumstances right now. But they do not have to determine the outcome of your life. The outcome of your marriage. The outcome of your children's lives. You may have come out of a troubled home. Or a bad family situation. You may have come out of abuse and pain. In fact, you might be in a mess right now, even as I am speaking to you, but that situation does not have to determine the outcome of your life. And Isaiah is emphasizing the unfavorable conditions the Messiah would appear from. He's basically saying it's going to be political chaos. It's going to seem insurmountable. Now, friend, that is a biblical pattern. The message of Isaiah 53 is that God is not moved by the situations that we struggle with. God is not moved by the situations that we struggle with. In fact, at the count of three, I'm going to say my name, you say your name, and together we are going to say that God is not moved by the situations that we struggle with. Because there are times that you have to strengthen yourself in the Lord or encourage yourself in the Lord. If no one else will encourage you, you have to encourage yourself in the Lord. And you have to verbally speak it. So again, I'm going to say my name, you say your name, and at the count of three, we will all say that God is not moved by the situations that I struggle with. Are you ready? You don't have to scream. The Holy Ghost, he's not deaf. (laughs) But, But you do have to say it. At the count of three, let's do that. One, two, three. Randy, God is not moved by the situations that we struggle with. Let's do that again. You say your name, I'll say mine. And then together we will say, God is not moved by the situations that we struggle with. Are you ready? One, two, three. God is not moved by the situations that we struggle with. The things that seem insurmountable to us are nothing to God. You may have a son or a daughter, a mother or a father, a family member, that the conditions and circumstances of their lives make it seem impossible for God to even make a change. You can't even imagine them walking across the parking lot and walking in here with a Bible in their hand. But that simply tells me that you don't fully understand the principle that God sent Jesus as a root out of dry ground. That he planted him into an impossible situation. In other words, God does not need anything from the environment, the social construct, or for that matter, any person or from anyone to move on the lives of people. He simply does what he wants to do because he is almighty God. He's all-knowing God. He's still the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is almighty God. He's not limited in any degree, shape, or form. If you believe that, someone just shout amen. Well, then Isaiah goes on to describe the lack of a physical attraction concerning Jesus. And he does this because Israel had a preconceived idea of who the Messiah would be. And 700 years prior to him coming, God is saying, Isaiah, tell them, get rid of the preconceived ideas of what I can do. 
There are so many listening to me right now in this room and online. You have a preconceived idea of what God can do or how God can move. And God is saying, get rid of the preconceived ideas. I can do so much more than you could possibly imagine or think in your life. Don't limit who I am. I am the limitless God. So Isaiah describes the lack of a physical attraction, that he would not fit into the stereotype of a former Jewish leader. In fact, his exact words were, there is no beauty that we should desire him. For instance, the Bible describes King David as strong and a handsome man, just good looking. If, if we, he was here today, the Bible says David is ruddy with a fine appearance and handsome features, kind of like Pastor Nelson. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> Today we would say David was a sight for sore eyes. Right there is a sight for sore eyes. Woo! The Bible described King Saul as being a head taller than all other men. Saul just looked like a leader. When he walked into the room, he stood out. He looked like a warrior, a winner, like a leader of men. He looked like a man that would grab your attention simply by him walking into the room. His presence would cause people to want to follow him. But that was not Isaiah's physical description of Jesus. He's basically telling them he won't be much to look at. Get rid of your preconceived ideas. God does not look at the outward appearance like man does. He looks at the heart of man. Then he goes on to say he will come to power out of dry ground or barren ground. It's a description of a person who looks like they don't have much of a chance to survive, let alone thrive and rise up to a movement to take over the world. Jesus was planted into an impossible situation. At the time that Jesus was born, sexual immorality was pandemic, much like it is today. They were serving multiple gods and false religions. Much like today. Hate was stronger than love. Much like today. The high priests and the religious system, they were corrupt. Israel had been invaded by the Babylonians and the Persians and the Greeks. And now conquered by the Romans. And politically, Israel was a shell of her bygone glorious past. Friends, you need to understand, in the world's view, had Jesus descended from the Caesars or the Pharaohs or from the Greeks, or some powerful person that had some wealth and armies and power, that might have given him a chance in their eyes to rise up to some sort of influence. But in the world's view, this Jesus is a root out of dry ground. He, he has nothing going for him. His birth was not in a royal nursery. It was in a stable with a peasant mother named Mary and a stepfather who was a blue-collar, manual laborer, carpenter. No room in the inn was how his life began. Then to add that to dry ground, to add insult to injury, he lived in Nazareth. <laughs> if you wanted to get a point across to show how pitiful somebody was, the catchphrase about Nazareth was, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Can anything good come out of, come out of Plainview? Mule shoe? Can anything good come out of West Texas? And every time he introduced himself as Jesus of Nazareth, he said to that culture, he's from trash. There's no lineage, nobody powerful has ever come out of Nazareth. Nothing of influence has ever come out of Nazareth. He's just a root out of dry ground. Now listen, if you didn't have anything going for yourself and you wanted to make an impact, at least surround yourself with great people. Surround yourself with winners. But the disciples he chose didn't do anything to build or advance the prestige of who he is. I mean, maybe if you would choose some men of renown, some highly successful people. Maybe someone with a degree in the theology or philosophy. I mean, bro, if you really want to get the attention of the culture, hire a TikToker, right? I hire somebody that, that was talented to get the message across, but Jesus chose fishermen. He chose cursors and fighters. He chose average people like me and like you. And he said, I choose you, come follow me. 
I choose you. Come follow me. What's amazing is this tender plant just didn't spring up, but the Bible says it grew. That tender plant that came out of the most difficult circumstances overcame the obstacles of where he came from to grow into a magnificent tree of life that would bring shelter and shade to the troubled lives of men and women who were weighed down with the pressures of life. They were afflicted with diseases, dealing with a hopeless situation. They can now run into the shadow of the almighty God and they can find the secret place where there is healing and there is hope through Jesus Christ of Nazareth. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Friends, Jesus knows what it is to come out of dry, barren ground. He knows what it is to come out of an impossible situation. Hebrews 4.12, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who is in every respect has been tested as we are yet without sin. Let me throw some illustration on that text right there. The Bible tells us that Jesus was fasting for 40 days and 40 nights preparing for his ministry, and at the height of that fasting period, when the man Jesus was at a weak moment. Remember, he's all man, yet he's all God. That's what makes him so wonderful. And when the man Jesus is at a weak moment, Satan, the deceiver, comes to him, and I love the phrase, the Bible says, in a moment of time. He takes him to a high peak, and Satan offers to Jesus the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He throws it all at him at once. And he says, I have been given this to give to you. It was Adam and Eve's sin that had given him the ability to offer these things to Jesus. Remember that he's after the man, not the God, the man. In that moment of time, all of heaven was weighing in the balance. Everything that God had done in the, from the Genesis, from the book of beginnings, all the way to Malachi, everything that had taken place in the old covenant, everything was weighing in the balance. The calling of Moses, the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, the miracle working ministry of Elijah and Elisha, the two greatest miracle working team of the Old Testament, Jeremiah, Enoch, Job, everything that took place is weighing in the balance if the man had given in to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Jesus quotes scripture to him in, out of Deuteronomy. He's living in a word overflow as opposed to a word deficit. And he says, get thee behind me, Satan. He knows what it is to be tempted yet without sin. He knows what it is to be rejected. He knows what it is to go to his own and his own reject him. He knows what it is to be ridiculed, tossed aside, betrayed by those he loves. The Jewish historian Josephus tells us, now this is historical, not scripture, but Josephus tells us that Jesus loved Judas probably more than the others, even, even more than his three closest associates, Peter, James, and John. And when Judas comes to betray him in the garden, he leans over and kisses him. Kind of like when you come into the house of your family, everybody gets a kiss or a hug. And when he kisses him, Jesus says, mijo. Because <laughs> you know the Holy Ghost is Puerto Rican. <laughs> well, in your case, it might be Mexican, I don't know. Is this how you would betray me? With a show of affection? And it causes me to wonder... How many of the six million people who claim to be born again in America are betraying him this morning with a show of affection? I've come today to tell you that that tender plant did not die. Oh, I know they crucified him. I know they laid him in the borrowed tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. But on the third day, I want to announce to you that the Holy Spirit of God invaded the borrowed tomb of Joseph of Arimathea and he raised to life again the three-day dead body of the Lamb of God. He is alive and he is well and he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. Oh, if you believe that, I want you to clap your hands and praise him. <laughs> Woo! Yes. I am so glad that Jesus on the cross cried out, it is finished. 
He didn't cry out, I am done. He said, it is finished. What he is speaking of is his part of the, of the plan that the Father sent him to fulfill. Upon the resurrection, he then transitions his ministry from an earthly ministry to a heavenly ministry. Now he's sitting at the right hand of the Father, and his ministry is to intercede or pray for you. He's praying for this church. He's praying for your grandchildren. He knows where you live, mijo. He knows who you are. He knows when you rise, and he knows when you lay down. He knows every hair on your head. He is praying for First Assembly in Plainview, in Muleshoe. He's praying for every other church. Oh, come on, if you believe that you should be able to understand that that he's praying for you right now he is alive and well Jesus of Nazareth conquered the woke culture woke is nothing new God the father planted him into a woke culture I was speaking to a Chi Alpha conference and uh, Chi Alpha is the ministries that we have to secular colleges, uh, Christian campus, uh, Christian kids that go to secular campuses, they have Chi Alpha. And some kid yelled in the back. He goes, hey, pastor, are you woke? I said, yeah, bro, I am. And the place went dead silent. I said, I am woke. I woke up to the fact that I'm a sinner saved by grace. I woke up to a fact that I need my Jesus more today than yesterday, but not half as much as I'm going to need him tomorrow. Is anybody else woke in that same way? <laughs> Hallelujah. Jesus conquered the culture. He broke all the stereotypes. He conquered death, hell, and the grave. And he holds the keys to eternal life. My Jesus is alive and well. And it's easy to get our eyes on this world when you see the craziness that's taking place politically. You see what's happening with Hamas. And you see what's going on with the Houthis. And you see what's going on politically in Washington. The woke culture. Good is now being called bad, and bad is now good. Seems like everything has turned topsy-turvy, and everywhere we look, it seems this old world is so evil, we can get discouraged and depressed, but we forget that he was not born into a perfect society. He came into dry ground. So if the Ivy League universities want to kick God out, the Ivy League universities want to be anti-Semitic against Israel. I call it the poison ivy. If they want to do those things, if, if the public education wants to do those things, don't worry. That's just dry ground for our students who are led by the power of the Holy Spirit to be planted in that dry ground. And he will prove again that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes unto the Father but by him. If you believe that, I want you to clap your hands and praise him. Yes. So what do we do? We fast and pray and we seek God. Then we take the seeds of the word of God and of the life of God and start planting Jesus into every dry area. <laughs> you didn't hear me. We plant Jesus in every dry area that is lifeless and barren. We will plant Jesus. Come on, somebody. We don't give up on people because they're in the middle of a dry season in their life. Even if they are resistant. Even if they are defiant. Even if they're in Flonada or Muleshoe. We don't give up on people because they're in Lubbock. Because Jesus is the root that flourishes in dry ground. He doesn't need anything outside of himself to survive. He is self-existent. He does not need political correctness to survive and thrive. He didn't need royalty acknowledging his name. He didn't need people to put him on the cover of Time Magazine or Life Magazine and call him Man of the Year. He doesn't need anybody acknowledging him as royalty. He is already the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He doesn't need CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, or for that matter, anyone else. He is eternally existent. He holds time in his hands. He doesn't need man's position, man's power, or man's wealth. He is the God who rides on the wings of a storm. He already owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He still is the lily of the valley and the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of 10,000. He is God Almighty. And if you 
believe that, I want you to clap your hands and praise him that he is alive and he is well. Oh, come on, church, praise him. He already walks on streets of gold. He already lives in the city that Abraham built, whose builder and maker was God. He is God Almighty. Whoo! And we need to lift our voice and praise him. We need to take a little praise break. I want you to just lift your hands and praise him right now. Come on, church, just praise him. I want you to lift your voice and praise him. Not for what he can do, but simply because who he is. He is almighty God. He is all-knowing God. You need to lift your voice in the middle of a desert and praise him right now. Mighty God. Mighty God. That's it. Don't stop. If you're sitting at home watching me on live stream, right where you're sitting, get out of the bed, lift your hands and praise him. Get off of your couch and praise him. He's the everlasting father. He's the prince of peace and the hope of glory. Hallelujah. 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 Mighty God. We need to come to a deep understanding of what I'm preaching. Oh, sit down. We're not done. We need to come to a deep understanding of what I'm preaching. God does not need the approval of a culture or anything for man to survive. This church does not need the approval of the culture to grow and survive. The root didn't need soil that was fertile or, per or perfect conditions to grow. He's the root out of dry ground. The soil contributed nothing to the root to have it grow up. So the question becomes what churches and Christians will decide to put biblical truth ahead of social and cultural acceptance. We need to approach God that way, you know. We need to get back to that because if we don't watch it, we begin to think, I'm all that. I I've got it together. Look at our church. We got the largest church in the city. We're really something. No, you're not. And neither am I. God can choose anyone he wants to use. He doesn't have to use you. He doesn't have to use me. He doesn't have to use Pastor Regina. He didn't have to use Pastor Nelson. He didn't have to use me. But when we look at our ministry and all that God is doing, we want you to know he didn't have to use us. But we came to him and said, God, I will give you room to move into my life and do whatever you want to do with me. My life is a dry, barren wilderness. I am nothing. I have nothing to offer. But friend, when we drop Jesus into our life, when we dropped him into our barren existence, he took our mind, he took our body, he took my heart, he took my dreams, he took my vision, he took my talent, and he said, let me breathe my anointing, my personality. Let me lay my hand upon your life. You can't do it on your own. I can do it through anybody. But since you gave me some room, First Assembly, because you allowed me to move in your life, I will take the dry barrenness of your life, breathe on it, and make something amazing. You bring me the ashes, and I'll give you gold. My Lord. Adverse conditions do not have to determine the outcome of your life. Adverse conditions do not have to determine the outcome of how many churches you plant. Just because you came from difficulty does not mean your life has to have a similar outcome. That's the message of Isaiah 53. The root out of dry ground says, plant Jesus in the ground of a drug addict. I don't need them to fix themselves. I don't need them to get more willpower. What I need is for First Assembly to start planting the seeds of the word of God into their life. And I will grow. You can plant Jesus in any adverse circumstance and he will grow. Plant him into a ghetto housing project invested with drugs and alcohol and he will grow. Plant him in a dysfunctional family and he will grow. He can even grow in your prodigal son and your prodigal daughter. 
I had a woman come to me. I made that statement, and she said, oh, pastor, that's a wonderful thought, but, but a preacher once told me that um, they have to have the will, and if they don't have the will, then it's, there's no use of whatever I do. I looked at her and said, that's a lie from the pits of hell. And I apologize to you for whatever preacher told you that. She goes, well, my kids don't have the will. And she said, why, why do you say that, that that was a lie? Because I looked at her and I said, well, you know what? Since Lazarus was dead, he didn't have any will. <laughs> but when Jesus called his name, he had to say, Lazarus, if he, didn't, if, he, if he would have just said, come out, the whole grave would have come jumping out. But he said, Lazarus, come forth. The man was dead. He had no will. And you might say, well, that's just one occasion. No, in Luke 7, 11, it tells us Jesus went to the village of Nain. His disciples were with him along with a very large crowd. And as they approached the village gate, they met a funeral that was coming out. They were carrying the dead body of a young man, and his mother was a widow. When Jesus saw her, he is moved with compassion, and he says to her, Mija, don't cry. Don't cry. Then he went over, and he touched the coffin. And the pallbearers immediately stopped. Is there anybody here that knows what it is to have Jesus touch your coffin. You, you might have had a dead situation in your life, but Jesus touched your coffin. Your marriage might have been on the way out, but Jesus touched your coffin. You might have been a drug addict or an alcoholic, but Jesus, he touched your coffin. Is there anybody here that knows what it is to have the master come in when it looks like all is lost and touch your coffin? If you do, somebody clap your hands and praise him. Hallelujah. The pallbearers immediately stopped. And he said, young man, I tell you, get up. The dead son sat up and he began talking. I don't know what he said, but when I get to heaven, I'm going to go look him up because there are some people I want to talk to when I get to heaven. Like, I want to talk to Samson. Say, hey, bro, she tied you up twice. <laughs> Duh. I mean, she must have been pretty hot because she even told you, Sammy, can you tell me the secret of your strength that I might afflict you? <laughs> Guys, if your girl says she wants to afflict you, <laughs> you got a major problem, bro. You got a, a major, twice. <laughs> and I want to go find out where this young man is. Say, hey, man. When he touched your coffin and you were on your way to the grave, what did you say? I believe he sat up and began giving praise. I believe he opened his mouth and out came, you are the lion of the tribe of Judah. You are the Alpha and the Omega. You are the beginning and you are the end. I believe he began to sing what the hymnologist wrote. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing praises to my king. You are God Almighty. Hallelujah. And the text tells us the people were watching and they were quietly worshipful. Like some are now watching, you're, you're quietly worshipful. And then they realized what they were seeing. And the Bible says they became noisily grateful. If you're wondering why we shout the way we shout, if you're wondering why we praise the way we praise, if you're wondering why we do what we do, we are noisily grateful that our tomb, our 
casket was on the way to the grave. But Jesus stepped in. Noisily grateful. And they began saying, God is back looking to the needs of his people. You see, that's what the root out of dry ground does. Friends, I want you to know that you may have a loved one in a gay lifestyle or a situation that looks hopeless. My dad's sister, her son that I grew up with, he's in a gay lifestyle. And over Christmas, we, we kind of, you know, we were together with the family. And he's my age. And I just turned 58 in June. I know I don't look like it. <laughs> but for you white folks, that's because brown don't crack. Because <laughs> y'all know it's true. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's amazing what you say under the anointing. It's just. <laughs> but my cousin, he walked up. And, I, and we're talking, and he tells me, he goes, yeah, bro, I, I watch you on YouTube, and I see all those things. He said, you need to know I was born this way. I said, you were? He goes, yeah. I said, all right, then you need to be born again. He looked at me kind of confused. He said, what do you mean? Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new again. The apostle said, you were once murderers and liars and cheaters and Thank God, when your casket was on the way, the Holy Ghost stopped it. God wants you to know it's not your job to fix your family or to wait till they say, yes, I'm open to it. They may be as resistant as they can be. They may be so messed up that they can't even give their way to, to say, I want God. I've got four adult children. I, I hug and kiss them every morning. My son Christian is 32. My son Morgan is 31. My son Quentin is 25, 27, excuse me, my daughter's 25. I hug and kiss them every morning. That's because they still live in my house. <laughs> A blessing I did not ask for. <laughs> I can see you are relating. <laughs> no, they don't. Only two of them live in the house, but I'm giving the food Buddha fellowship right now. But when they were in college, all of them have degrees, advanced degrees. Thank God. They got that from the white side of the family, the mother. And, uh, but when they were in college and, you know, at the University of Arkansas, the University of Missouri, Missouri State, it was a constant apologetic tour. Well, Dad, my professor said this, and he's got a PhD. In me. And they're just, it was a constant apologetic tour. And the more I tried to convince them, the more they pushed away. And one day in prayer, the Holy Spirit said, will you shut up? <laughs> Have you ever had the Holy Ghost just tell you, shut up? You're in my way. I love them more than you do. I created them. I knew them before you even saw them. I, I knew them before they even existed. I created them in their mother's womb. I selected their hair color. I selected their eye color. I selected their gender. You're trying to do my job and you're not the Holy Ghost. Get out of the way. And I want to relieve some of you. You're not the Holy Ghost for your wife. You're not the Holy Ghost for your husband. It becomes so difficult when you're trying to do his job that you're not equipped for. And I said, well, Lord, what, then what do I do? You pray. You fast. The power of fasting. The Western culture does not understand the power of the fast. You want to see miracles? Fast and pray. It's just no, you know, it's not just so you can lose weight. <laughs> hey. 
but it's to set into motion things that you cannot conceive of. In the greatest message ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gave us a, a, a trifle called when you give, when you pray, and when you fast. Not if you pray, if you give, and if you fast, but when you do these things. So Randy, I want you to fast, and I want you to pray. And when you begin to love them, when you begin to reach for them, when you start texting them and planting scripture, just, just send a text. It's a private message. I'm praying for you. I love you. I believe in you. You're planting Jesus into the dry ground. And nothing can stop his grace. Nothing can stop his power. Nothing can hold down what he says is coming up. Are you hearing me? I feel Jesus in this place. We plant Jesus into the depression of a generation. Plant Jesus into their suicidal thoughts. Plant Jesus into their fear, their doubt, into the doubt of your grandchildren, into the doubt of your wayward son or daughter. When you truly give yourself over to Jesus, he'll begin to show you the hidden gems he has planted in your life. Listen to me. When you spend time with the root out of dry ground, he begins to show you who you are. He begins to show you your purpose in life. Today, stop worrying about that you can't change. Stop saying, I can't quit. I'll never make it. And just give Jesus some room in your life. Run to him and say, Jesus, take this dry and barren ground and give me life abundantly and full of your glory. Are you hearing me? In Acts 1 and 8, Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, in the uttermost parts of the earth. Why do we have satellite churches? We're going to plant Jesus in every city that is dry and barren. Mom and dad, children's pastors, youth pastors, hear me. Let's train our children how to be his witnesses and plant Jesus. Train a generation because Jesus can fix the gender confusion. Jesus can fix political correctness. He's almighty God. Plant him in world missions. Plant him in Africa. Plant him in the jungles of South America. Plant him in socialist Europe and watch the church come alive. Plant him in Russia. Jesus of Nazareth is greater than Vladimir Putin. He's greater than the Kremlin. Plant him in the Middle East. The message of the hour is simple. Plant Jesus into the lives of people. Even if you don't see a change, keep planting. Keep watering with your tears of intercession. The enemy is whispering, it's too dry. It's too barren. They'll never come about. No, my God is the God of the impossible. My God can do all things. I believe in God the Father, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only son who was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. Is there anybody that believes in that creed? I believe. Don't give up on anybody in your family or the ones that God places on your mind because God says, I'm the root at a dry ground. The power of praise. I want our musicians to come quickly. The power of praise. He loves them more than you do. And for those of you that are listening to this message and you're listening to this ministry and you're saying, well, Randy, when I stop doing this and when I stop doing that, when I get out of this mess or when I get out of that mess, then I'll give my life to Jesus. I'm so far from perfect. <laughs> Look around the room. I mean, if you don't think Jesus has a sense of humor, look around this room. We are all so far from perfect. Today I say to you, it's not an accident that you're listening to this message. The Spirit of God that loves you has directed you here. 
in a moment of time. Listen very carefully as I try to close this. That phrase, and I could, I could preach a whole series of messages on that phrase in a moment of time. Listen, each one of us will have a time in our life that the choice you make will determine your destiny. In a moment of time, Jesus in Gethsemane said, not my will, but thy will be done. In a moment of time. There are some of you here that this moment right now will determine your destiny. Determine the outcome of your marriage. I believe the reason that God led you to listen to me is he wants you to know it's not up to you to make it happen. Saying, I've got to do better. I've got to clean up my act. I've, done, I've got to, no, 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 no. The only thing you have got to do is give your heart to God. And when you really surrender and let him get planted into your life, he will grow and start cleaning you up. It's easy to live in regrets. Thinking, God is not going to help me because I made the mess. But hear this amazing truth about the, good, the God of grace. God knows human nature. He knows your human imperfections. He knows he would, you would get off course and in times that you would be giving into temptation. God has not based the plan of your life for your life upon you, your ability to make perfect decisions. No, he has a plan to turn your failures around. What you think is a failure, you blew it and you think nothing can come out of it. God says, you bring me the ashes and I'll bring, give you back beauty. He could take what should have left you lonely and disappointed, what should have limited your career, what should have crippled your marriage, and turn it around and pick you up, stop your coughing, clean you up, and move you into a new greater destiny. I want to encourage you because God is so full of mercy and grace. He doesn't turn his back on you the moment you fail in sin. He says, come on. I read about a lawyer that was trying to get a hold of a man. And the man thought that he was trying to uh, bring him a subpoena. And so for 14 years, this man evaded this lawyer. But this lawyer was very persistent. 14 years into it, the man got sick and he's in the hospital dying of cancer. As he's lying there, the lawyer walks into the room. The man looks at him and he says, you are persistent. All right, give me the subpoena. What good is it now? And the lawyer said, subpoena? I have a document here to prove that you have inherited $45 million. And you've been running from me, and I've got this blessing for you. And that's how some people are. They're running from God. We're effectively saying, get away from God, get away from me. It's too dry. It's too barren. I, I can't, I, God can't move in my life. I want to live the way I want to live. God is saying, I, I've got amazing things for you. If you'll just turn it to me. And God not only can correct complications, but he can somehow use it years later to bless your descendants. How, Pastor? Because we believe in God the Father, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only son, who is our Lord and Savior, born of a virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, dead, and buried. We believe in the holy Christian church, the millennial reign, and we believe he's coming again. He's coming again. He's coming again. If you believe what I've been preaching, 
I want you to stand, lift your hands, and begin to praise the root out of dry ground right now. Just praise him all over the room. Just praise him. Just praise him. For the Holy Spirit's in this room right now to heal, save, deliver, and heal. He's about to set free marriages. He's about to set free people. There's no situation so dry that my Jesus cannot move in. Right where you're standing, I want you to call out the name of your grandchildren. I want you to call out the name of your children. Holy Spirit, right now, for Flonada, the world says it's dry ground. The world says we cannot do anything. But, Father, we've planted you there. We're going to continue to plant you there. Lord, for Muleshoe. Father, the radius of this church is to reach to the ends of the earth. Radius of the power of God. Radius church. My Lord, I might have just named the church. You got an impossible situation right now. Begin to speak it out and plant Jesus into that situation.